Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Los Altos Community Coalition. It's great to have you all with us today. Um, before we get started, uh, I'm sure that many of you have heard of the passing of our dear friend, Larry Barron. Larry oh. devoted uh, countless hours volunteering to many causes in Los Altos, including Los Altos Community Coalition. Uh, he spent so much time helping us with all of the LACC videos. Uh, that's actually how I got to know him uh, very well over, over the last year or so. And for that, we're truly grateful. Um, I always got a chuckle out of Larry's self-intro at LACC, where he introduced himself simply as Larry Barron, still a resident. We will miss him. And on behalf of the LACC steering committee, we wish his wife, Trisha, and all of his family and friends our deepest condolences. Thank you for indulging me uh, with that this morning. So our uh, program today is entitled A Discussion About Automated License Plate Readers, ALPRs, with Rene Rashid, President of Los Altos for Racial Equity, and Hector Solomon Valdez, Senior Community Affairs Manager for of Flock Safety. Um, we know this is a topic of great interest uh, in Los Altos right now, and we think you'll enjoy the conversation today. Let me start by introducing our two guests, a software engineer who has worked in ed tech, med tech, and virtual and augmented reality. Rene Rashid took a break from tech in 2019 and became involved in local advocacy and activism. She has served on various local boards and served as a mentor for local students and other entrepreneurs. She founded Los Altos for Racial Equity in 2021 and has been involved with it ever since, working with the local city council, police department, and community to analyze and recommend police policies and push for more accountability and transparency. She loves to go hiking, skiing, and traveling whenever she can. Welcome, Renee. Hector Solomon Valdez is a senior community affairs manager at Flock Safety. Through his role, he helps communities implement technology that provides objective evidence to local law enforcement while safeguarding privacy. Hector has worked as an urban planner at public agencies in both Florida and California and holds a master's in urban and regional planning from the University of Central Florida. Hector is a member of the LA Metro Public Safety Advisory Committee, whose mission is to help Metro achieve its goal of safeguarding the transit community while providing world-class service to all users. Welcome, Hector. Thank you both so much for um, being with us this morning. Um, we know uh, there's been a great deal of discussion and debate in Los Altos, and we really appreciate uh, the two of you sharing your views. Um, I'd like to start this morning uh, getting us all familiar with the basics of ALPRs uh, for those who have not uh, studied up on them or haven't uh, you know, looked into the issue previously and specifically flock ALPRs, because those are the ones that are under consideration here in Los Altos. Um, Hector, I, I think most people know ALPRs are cameras of some, some sort, but I suspect that few really understand the details. Um, if you could take a moment just to walk us through how the flock ALPRs work, from how they take photos to the data that's gathered um, and how the police department finds out about that data and whatever happens after that. Awesome, good morning. Uh, thank you all for joining us with this discussion today. Um, I wanted just to start off by providing you all a little bit of background on Flock Safety specifically. Uh, we are an Atlanta-based company. We were founded uh, when our CEO and his neighbors were victims of uh, multiple crimes. They had a lot of break-ins, uh, you know, car uh, break-ins, burglaries, et cetera. Um, and like many of you, they had ring cameras, other types of video footage and believed, hey, you know, this is the first time that, or, you know, maybe just the second time they had been a victim of a crime. They believed that providing this footage, they would go to their police, they would be able to help sub solve that crime right away. What they found out is that um, many times uh, that, that wasn't enough. Uh, Atlanta PD let our CEO know what we really need in these cases to start an investigation is a license plate where we can now start, you know, finding out what that red Honda, to, to give an example, who uh, who may have been in there or who may have been committing these crimes. So started doing research on automatic license plate readers. And what he found is that 
uh, these cameras were extremely expensive, 10,000 uh, or tens of thousands of dollars per camera. Communities would have to purchase the camera individually. And just like when you purchase an iPhone, you all know in a couple of years, sometimes it'll be obsolete. And so set out to build um, a, a software as a service type model uh, where we uh, main, install the cameras, uh, maintain the cameras, and provide all of the service associated with that. Um, in addition to that, because he was found, uh, you know, trying to bring this to his community, uh, really the other thing that he saw is that a lot of the legacy providers would uh, sell data uh, and, and share data. And, and so he really wanted this to be a solution where privacy and ethics was um, at, at the forefront. So that is really the background on Flock and how we were founded. Today, we're in over 1,400 communities nationwide. And the cameras specifically, well, how do they work? Many of you, your experience with license plate readers may be when you're going into a shopping center, right? There, your plate will get read. It's part of that um, tickets for you to pay um, upon exit. This technology has been around for a long time. Our cameras, the way that they work is that they're placed in fixed locations. They're focused on the back of the vehicle. Um, they will take a still image with metadata associated with that vehicle. So what that means is it'll, you know, police will be able to search by a description that you may provide. As I hopefully no one here drives a red Honda because I'll use that as an example. Uh, but, you know, if it's a red Honda, you'll be able to search for that type of vehicle. So that's one aspect for investigations. The other one, which is really important, is the proactive um, side of things, right? So we are connected to the California Stolen Vehicle System, which will provide police alerts if a stolen vehicle, felony vehicle, or stolen plate enters your community in the computers in their vehicles within 20 seconds. Um, in addition to that, they'll be provided alerts of any uh, vehicle associated with an Amber Alert or a missing persons alert. These things are really important. That speed to, for them to know this is really important because seven out of 10 crimes, there's a vehicle involved, right? So this helps start that investigation and potentially either, you know, stop a crime that's in progress or prevent a future crime. Um, as I mentioned earlier, these are fixed locations. With our software, with our system, they are also infrastructure free. So as I said, we install them. We uh, will install them with solar panels and connected to uh, the inter uh, internet through uh, cellular, the cellular network, right? So really taking all of the kind of uh, work out of the city, right? So that the city doesn't have to add additional FTEs or the police don't have to have uh, folks working on, you know, maintaining this. We do all that for uh, the city. Uh, we have technicians that are flock employees, not contractors, so that we can manage the quality control and have somebody out there within 72 hours if there's any, ever any issues with the camera. So that's a little bit of background on, on who we are as a company and how we're, our, uh, the Falcon cameras work. Great, thank you. And if I could just follow up. Um, so once once the photo is taken and, and there's a license plate or there's no plate or like whatever the situation is, what what happens with that data? Like, you know, I imagine it goes off to the police department somehow. Um, do they do they get a text message? Does it go into dispatch? Like, what what where does the alert go? That's a great question. So, as I mentioned, there's two facets that we're really going to hone in on today, which is the investigative purposes, right? If a vehicle um, is scanned, you know, a vehicle passes by the camera, an image will be taken of that vehicle with the metadata. If for whatever reason there's a need, to, there's an investigation, right, um, which, is, which requires a case number. So that's something that's really important to note with our system. Police have to have a case number. They will put that into the system. They will then find results. Um, so it's at the Amazon Web Server government cloud. So it's encrypted there, right? At that point, they can assess it. They can see, you know, use that for their investigations. Uh, the other aspect is uh, a hot list alert they will immediately be alerted in the vehicle. So there'll be um, kind of a chime, let's say like a little bell saying, hey, there is a vehicle passing by this camera. It'll tell them which cameras they're at. Your dispatchers will also get these alerts. And um, you know your policy uh, that, the, that I've seen that the, the chief has shared, there's a, a clearing, right? So making sure, hey, what we're seeing here is what I see in person, is what is in the in our most up to date uh, uh, resources. So that so that's how that happens or works for hot list alerts uh, specifically. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I really really appreciate uh, getting us all you know kind of on the same page around how the this the system actually works. Yeah, and so, so one oh, last go ahead. Thing. Uh, also to mention with us, our standard retention is 30 days. So all of those images are hard deleted at 30 days and no longer available uh, to anyone. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, Renee, uh, you know, you, you and I have 
had conversations about ALPRs um, in the past. Uh, would love to get your thoughts on ALPRs and also the you know potential deployment of flock ALPRs in Los Altos. If you could take a minute here. Yep. Um, so. Look, any proposal to solve an issue uh, should have a cost benefit analysis. So if we do that for our ALPR proposal, the 25 ALPR cameras that are being proposed are going to cost the city uh, 75,000 a year. Um, and so that's the, the baseline cost, not including any additional staffing costs that may be needed or overtime work. We're, we're not sure if that would be needed right now or not, but that's baseline cost. Um, then they have an additional cost in terms of the civil liberties that each of us is giving up to live in a more surveilled state. So I've heard sentiments to the effect of, well, if you don't do anything wrong, you should be fine with it. But the reality is that ALPR systems themselves have been used to monitor like the activities of Muslim mosque attendees in NYC. They've been used to track protesters. ICE has used ALPR data to track undocumented immigrants, including in California, where it is illegal, but not using flock systems. Um, and it could be used to track down those that obtain abortions. So surveillance definitely has a cost to all of us. And we don't know that surveillance tech that is installed today may be used for a different pur purpose down the road, right? But once it's out of the bag, it's kind of out there. Um, so that has a cost. The other cost is the cost of errors. Just like there are anecdotal success cases for ALPRs, there are anecdotal failures. The very recent one nearby was in Atherton in 2021, where a security guard was stopped at gunpoint by police who said his car was stolen. Um, the reader thought his H's were M's and Atherton uses flock cameras. Um, so Atherton is now facing a lawsuit for, for that, and there are examples from across the state of the same thing happening, um, incorrectly identified stolen cars resulting in innocent people being held at gunpoint. Um, Flock Safety ha touts a 93% read accuracy rate, I believe that's correct, Hector. Um, but those 7% read errors get compounded with errors in the hot list the stolen car databases that we could match against, for example, um, which may not get updated when a stolen car gets returned or which rental cars can be flagged incorrectly as stolen, uh, just even if people were late on their payment but still in contact with them. So that has led to um, innocent people, people being held at gunpoint. And so those errors compounded could can lead to much higher error rates. Um, so then what are the benefits, right? The goal is for us, the stated goal for Los Altos has been to increase um, crime solvability rates of property crimes. So that includes like stolen vehicles, residential and commercial burglaries, things like that by 10 percentage points over our this one year pilot period. So that's a worthy goal. We should be keeping Los Altos is a safe community, and we should be catching criminals. Um, our solvability rate is currently 4%, but it's been that way for the past six years. And that's way lower than like the statewide average around 15%. Um, so you would think that ALPRs would help in catching criminals. It, it certainly sounds like it would help, but unfortunately the data doesn't show that. Um, there hasn't been a ton of research study on this. There's more happening, but the few studies that we did show um, showed conflicting results. And most of the studies were actually just looking at stolen car um, data. And so one study showed that ALPRs did help in returning stolen vehicles, led to more arrests. And one study showed, um, the other study showed that there was a very weak correlation between vehicle recoveries and ALPRs. Um, so yes, we do hear the anecdotal data we, that Atherton identified a burglary suspect, made several felony arrests, LAH made seven arrests, located 10 wanted vehicles, um, but LAH ALPRs did not clear a single residential burglary case. 
in Atherton, they had 47% um, clearance of property crimes in 2017, and it's steadily dropped since then to 15% in 2020 and 21. And they had gotten ALPRs in 2020. So it has not improved those clearance rates in Atherton. Um, and so that very weak outcome doesn't justify the cost for us. We feel there are better ways to increase property crime clearance and hopefully decrease the property crime in our city, um, like hiring a detective or perhaps a crime analyst or perhaps both. Those may be more expensive, but if they're more effective, then we should pursue those. So that's kind of our stance on uh, what we're looking at for ALPRs. Great, thank thank you so much. Um, I I think we could probably spend the entire program, you know, on these topics right here. Uh, I'm going to move us on to the next question, Hector. If there's anything specific you want to cover uh, with regards to Renee's comments, you know, feel feel free as well. But um, uh, you know, I think you know that Los Altos Hills just uh, completed their one re year review of the flock system. And for those who aren't aware, according to the staff report, there were five cases where the ALPR system helped to solve an open case, seven arrests and 10 wanted vehicles, but no residential burglary cases um, were solved by the ALPR system from what I understand. Um, in one case, a wanted vehicle had burglary tools in it. So it's possible that that person was cruising around, you know, trying to find a place to uh, to rob, uh, so it's it's possible that that was prevented, but you know it brings up the question around uh, metrics. And what I wanted to ask you, Hector, was um, what what do you and or Flock feel is the best metric to judge ALPR success with, and do you view Los Altos Hills as a successful deployment after their one year uh, having done so? Yeah, thank you for the question. So. You know, I think it's really important to to note that Los Altos Hills and Los Altos, for example, have a completely different setup, and it's really hard to you know it's an apples to oranges type of comparison, and that's for several reasons. In Los Altos, um, you have many more full time residents, right? So that really does impact in the way you know crimes are reported, the way that policing is done. It's also the di there's different geography, there's different setup as far as commercial properties, which have different crimes associated with them, right? So there's going to be different metrics there. And I, I start kind of off with that because that success looks different for different communities. Um, as far as uh, when, when Los Altos uh, itself is, you know, there is a need or there's been a state of need from the, the business community and also residents to solve crime using this. And what we see, I work with communities um, nationwide is that councils and, and the community will set out to measure this success if it's a pilot project as as being proposed in Los Altos by saying, well, how much, how many dollars are we um, bring, you know, uh, uh, getting back in stolen goods, for example. So measuring dollar amounts, um, how many stolen vehicles, how many crimes are, I mean, guns and, and, and drugs are taken off the street. That's one way to measure things. But the other thing that we see is that there's an immeasurable uh, side to this. One is um, an Amber Alert or a stolen, or excuse me, a missing or endangered elderly person. There's those type of stories are measured differently because you can't really quantify them um, using dollars. So you'll kind of see that communities will will measure um, at the end of their uh, program in that way. And I do know that the chief has also wanted to put as very specific numbers to types of crimes. And I think that that is a good uh, way to measure things as well. Um, because she's honing in on things that she feels as your chief with the information that she knows that 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 these can this technology can make an impact on. Um, additionally, you know, there is that deterrence factor. It's as you mentioned in the Los Altos Hills case, for example, um, there is a vehicle that had tools in it that were going to potentially commit a crime. It's really hard. You can't really measure what that crime that was prevented, um, uh, you know, what what cost to society that would have been. So those are the things that we as flock see as, as ways to, to measure crime. I can tell you in San Marino, they, they reported an over 70% drop in their um, home burglaries, right? And so I, I see them as a little bit more relating to you all having, again, a very uh, people that live there, these are not second homes, uh, lots that are some more similar, also having commercial areas. So 
uh, just really important to note those things. And then wanted to go back to the Atherton case too. As you see, they are um, also you know seeing a lot of success, and Los Altos Hills is seeing success, and it looks different there. Um, but the technology is working as intended, right? It's solving different crimes. It is providing a stopgap, as as Renee mentioned, making sure you know that hits are validated. What we do is um, we provide a probability rate to police police officers, right? A triangle that says, hey, take a look at this. This may be reduced uh, probability here, et cetera. Um, but then there's uh, having good policy, right? So the policy, making sure that you have a visual, that you're seeing that. And then in those specific cases in Atherton, making sure that you still are protecting that person, giving them the due process. Um, but in, in that case, it was actually not the machine learning. Um, it was a, a plate that was so completely covered with mud that the human eye also, um, you know, made that error. So it was impossible. And we have to remember in the state of California, having an obstructed plate is something um, that is also against the law. Um, and so, you know, there's the human verification that's really important that did occur in, in that situation. Um, and so we just want to mention, obviously, kind of show that this is a very complex issue, but having a system that is as accurate as possible tied to um, having, uh, you know, police uh, do their due diligence is, is what's really important. Great, thank you. Um, Renee, um, if you, you've already shared a few thoughts on Los Altos Hills, but if you could um, comment on that, as well as the, the best metric to judge ALPR success. Right, sure. Um, so I think like Los Altos Hills is very telling on what happens with pilot projects. Um, the initial goals for LAH to install ALPRs was to deter crime and help create a safer environment. So it's a bit vague, right? Um, but based on their data, uh, residential burglaries in 2022, which is after they had ALPRs, hit an all-time high of 51, um, compared to their 10-year average about 50, 25 per year. So did the ALPRs help deter crime? It doesn't look like it, but yet it still got renewed, um, right? So once you have a tool for a pilot, the argument for if you have data to support it becomes, hey, look, the tool works, but the argument for not having the data to support it. Well, uh, imagine what would have happened if we didn't have it, or well, it makes us feel better, um, or the goalposts change along the way. So I think we need to be very careful about pilot projects and to really make sure it's what we want long-term because I think it's hard to discontinue um, pilots, right? With or without data to support it. Um, and so, we do need to be very careful looking at these metrics because the variation in year over year crime data is very noisy, right? It has ups and downs. And this is true of Los Altos, Los Altos Hills, Atherton. Um, and, and so to be able to attribute uh, any downturn to ALPRs is, is concerning. Like we can't really make that, um, attribution, that connection to causality uh, for certain, right? So you need to look longer term. And so, so what you want um, with metrics is usually you want to align your metrics with the goals you want to achieve and not look at not what are the achievable targets with this technology, right? So what are our actual goals? We want to reduce property crime in Los Altos. So then we should measure if we can reduce the rate of property crime measured with perhaps a six month rolling average to reduce that noise in the data. And then secondly, I think we do want to increase our solvability rate of property crime. So again, the solvability rate as, as proposed um, to increase, uh, I think it was 10 percentage points over this one year pilot period um, would be a, a good metric. Um, and then we should be analyzing at the end of the pilot to see if it really met, um, helped us in achieving those goals. Um, because from the Los Altos Hills staff report, there's a sentence in there um, that says, uh, 
I'm going to read this word for word. It is impossible to tell whether the presence of the cameras themselves could have deterred additional burglaries from happening, but in all, the cameras remain a reminder to the citizens of Los Altos Hills that the town cares about their safety and that the council is actively trying to reduce crime in, from occurring in town. So LAH is spending $177,000 to show that they care, not because it was an effective tool. Um, that doesn't seem like a very good spend. So um, I think, yeah, I went over the metrics that I think would be best for us, but we should be make sure we should make sure we're meeting those metrics. Great, thank you. Um, all right, we're gonna move on to the next question. Um, and Hector, I'm sorry for throwing these uh, these uh, somewhat difficult questions toward you, but uh, I think I think it's it's the best way to do this. So uh, we talked a little bit about um, 2022, still in the pandemic, you know, coming out of it uh, part way, halfway, who knows. Um, but, you know, in 2022, crime rose in Los Altos Hills, but dropped in Atherton. And both are cities that have deployed flock systems. Um, I, I've actually had conversations with a number of people who are here today um, and learned that, um, you know, some believe that it was the police response time of roughly 13 minutes in Los Altos Hills versus 2.5 minutes in Atherton that has something to do with the difference in crime. Um, others say ALPRs have a deterrent effect, but as we've discussed, you know, it's it's hard to quantify this. You can't really A-B test with, you know, cameras and no cameras at the same time. Um, could you share your thoughts on the impact of police response time? And I have to admit, I, I don't know what Los Altos um, police response time is and the um, potential deterrent effect that we've been talking about. Yeah, and I think this goes kind of to the conversation that we're having is how, you know, it's a, it's a, not an apples to apples comparisons many times, the types of crimes that communities face, uh, the geography impacts, you know, response time, it, uh, the type of businesses or just kind of zoning, right? Um, so it's, it's really hard to kind of pinpoint th those things. But what I can talk about is, the fact that with flock cameras, we will provide a, po a police department an alert within 20 seconds. Um, you know, police officers have to then triage that information. They have conflicting, you know, priorities at that time. Uh, they may be on a different service call. Um, it may just take longer to get there. So those are some of the things that may be impacting in, in different communities. Um, but as far as our technology is concerned, we'll provide that objective information um, within 20 seconds. Um, and then, you know, different police departments will, will do um, things as, as they can. Um, I do um, want to note that your police department is probably a little bit closer to Atherton in the sense that, you know, it is a local police department. So those are the things that are also going to um, you know, uh, come into play here, um, where this is the singular focus, as you've seen, Chief Averett has been really um, instrumental in, in getting out there um, with the policy and just explaining this technology. Um, so I, th I think that there, that's also just a, a different level of service. Um, so all those things um, come to play as well. Okay, great. And just for those who aren't aware, um, Los Altos Hills is policed by the, um, the sheriff, and who who also are in Cupertino and other cities, which might explain, you know, they have to drive from Cupertino up to Los Altos Hills, which takes longer, whereas Atherton has its own police force, just as Los Altos does. So um, that that could account for some of the differences we see there. Um, Renee, um, if you could respond with your thoughts on police response time, and uh, you spent a little time on the deterrent effect as well, but um, on both of those topics, please. Yeah, so um, you were mentioning the, the Atherton data again, and I think that was still one year. So it is hard to draw conclusions from one year of data. It could be noise, um, uh, criminals targeting a specific area before moving on to another. But I do think that response time is very important as a deterrent for crime, especially property crime because if burglars know they only have three minutes to grab things before police get there versus 15 minutes, they'll probably go somewhere else. Um, and yes, we found uh, studies that show decreasing response time leads to better clearance rates. So that is something important to consider. Um, I think that ALPRs would help in response time in the particular case of stolen vehicles, 
since police get the immediate notification for that, but may not always help in other property crimes like burglaries or catalytic converter thefts. Um, so in fact, if, if we have a goal to reducing response time um, and there's a choice between hiring another patrol officer and going with ALPRs, then it would probably be more impactful to choose another patrol officer if, if that's our goal. Great, thank you. Um, all right, next question, I'll, uh, I'll lead with Renee. Um, Renee, if um, Los Altos does uh, make a decision in the coming weeks to move forward with ALPRs, what um, policy or procedural recommendations would you have for the city? Right, so, so we've looked, Lara has looked, uh, Los Altos for racial equity, I call it, Lara has looked extensively at ALPL our policies. And we think that the submitted policy that we've seen so far is not sufficient to prevent misuse of the system, um, nor does it have sufficient oversight. So um, among the immediate and like recommendations that should absolutely be changed, and we, and we still need to look further as well, but um, oversight of which hot list the PD subscribes to should belong to city council and not uh, it, as it's currently listed as the ALPR administrator. Um, so city council should have final say over which hot list we are subscribed to, and that should not be able to be changed without city uh, council approval and public input. Um, that transparency needs to be there um, because otherwise there's, there's possibilities for uh, the public to not be aware of what it is being used for. Um, and changes in that usage. Um, so as Hector said, ALPR data in the cloud is only stored for 30 days. That same uh, criterion should apply to any downloaded data unless it's actively being used for an investigation. I think the proposed policy says that downloaded data can be used for one year, um, but we should have that same 30 day limit on downloaded data. Um, an independent police auditor should conduct or a independent auditor should conduct a yearly ALPR audit. Um, an ALPR audit is required. A yearly ALPR audit is required by the state, but uh, that should be an independent auditor, not, not the PD. Uh, just like companies get audited for their financial records by outside auditors, the same thing should happen. Um, to ensure that we are using this data properly. Um, this would free up PD's valuable time as well and ensure that we have outside verification. Um, and lastly, and one of the most important is that we have many loopholes in our policy through the use of exigent circumstances um, for the method in which police handle the, um, the hit uh, the match with the license plate. And so this is actually um, police officers must double check the correct vehicle and do a manual read of license plates before a high risk stop for a stolen car. Because that's a felony stop that involves drawn guns. Um, and because of the high error rates, this is this just reliance on an ALPR hit um, to justify these traffic stops can be challenged in court unless the ALPR hit is confirmed by other means. And this is supported by case law in California, um, San Francisco, San Francisco um, had a lawsuit and this was confirmed by case, case law that before doing that stop, officers must do that. So there's no exigency case, right? Um, and this is what's written in the Alameda County policy, which was vetted by the AACLU. Um, there is no exigency case. Either you are able to verify or you don't make the stop. And we still have these exigency cases that lead to lawsuits and we just cannot have that. So those are four examples, um, but there could be more analysis. Like if we decide to go this down this path, then I think we need to look at the policy carefully. 
Great, thank you. Uh, Hector, any thoughts on uh, policy or procedural recommendations? Yeah, um, I definitely will definitely want to say, I think one of the, the things that I see is um, really effective is when a police department does this level of engagement. We work with departments all over the country and sometimes, you know, it's it's not something that's done, right? And so that's why we definitely, you know, support this, um, having organizations such as Renee's um, be involved in, in providing input into the policy that helps make sure that the the, the you know eventual policy reflects the community's uh, values. So that's to start off. The second thing is um, making sure that the system provides transparency um, automatically. So with Flock Safety, we have the transparency portal, which I think Renee made a really good point is like, hey, this is the stated goal today what is being done in the future, right? And so with the Flock Transparency Portal, you will see who your department is sharing with. You will see what their policy is, if any changes have been made, what they're searching, et cetera. Um, and then it's also important to note, you know, in addition to that, that there, there's requirements for a case number, that there is that limited retention. So, you know, it's again, it's good policy, um, old community input, and then um, technology that's made um, ethically. I do want to just mention a couple of things, because um, I think what Renee said is really important on the hot list. Um, with flock safety in the state of California, they, the URD police department only can receive California stolen vehicle systems. And for the folks in, in, the, in the room that may not be um, too immersed in that world, um, in California, you can only receive alerts for stolen vehicles, stolen plates, and felony vehicles. So there's no NCIC alerts, which are what um, many other states use. Those have reasons that are not allowed in California. So our system is um, following state law, only using a state list. Um, and the great thing is that we, in the state of California, so I think really going into how um, these type of systems are being used, this is probably the most robust state as far as you know, oversight into technology. And so um, there is the California's Values Act, SB 54, et cetera, that prohibit, um, you know, sharing of this data with um, immigration enforcement, et cetera. And we follow that by only using state resources, right? And so NCIC alerts, which are used in many other states, do have alerts on immigration violations, et cetera. And so that pre prevents that from ever happening. Um, and it, it's just not available in the system. Um, and then as far as data and that's downloaded, I think that's a really good point. What I've seen in the policy, where I understand that to be is that, you know, if it's a part of an ongoing investigation, that is when the data can be downloaded. It then follows that chain of custody, for lack of a better word, for um, other um, investigations that are ongoing. Um, and some do have a longer retention, right? Depending on, hey, is this a violent crime? That may have a longer retention. So you want to have that flexibility that it, it is taking that data or that footage, that evidence is 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 tied to the type of crime and the type of investigation. And so that, you know, it's really important to to have that oversight, provide those um, the you know community values, and then just making sure that it matches also with the the reality of policing and, and how it's done effectively. And so those are just things that we you know again I work with departments all west of the Mississippi, which includes you know states as Texas um, and Illinois. And, well, Illinois is not west of the Mississippi, but I do work with them. And so just want to mention like th those are some of the differences and and some of the benefits in, that we have in California. Great, thank you, Hector. Um, we're we're running a little over here, um, but I want to give you both a chance for just some brief closing re remarks, um, and then we'll get to the questions. Uh, Hector, um, if you could share your closing thoughts or remarks, please. Yeah, I think uh, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, Flock Safety um, is a company that has been founded to provide technology to police that's objective or evidence that's objective. Um, while at the same time being the industry leader um, when it comes to ethics, um, limited privacy, ensuring that you as a community have a way to, to see what work is being done through the transparency portal. And so we're really proud of that. And also just really proud of, uh, to be honest, of, of your community. I've talked to Lair before, I've talked to different folks and just the work that the chief has been doing. So I think that that's really important. I think that this discussion and making sure that people really are aware of like, hey, what is being done and provide input, um, not just today, but just in the future. And I think what, one of the great benefits is that you do have a department you know, that is doing a lot of outreach. And so I commend you all with that. And we're excited to um, hopefully be able to partner um, with your city. And we're really proud of all of the cases that we help close every single day um, throughout the, the United States with our law enforcement partners. Great, thank you. Uh, Renee, any closing thoughts or remarks? 
Yeah, I'll just keep it brief. Um, we want Los Altos to be a safe community rather than just feel like a safe community. So let's use our limited budget money wisely and invest in ways that actually do that. Thank you so much. And I want to I want to share one thought, which was um, I was asked this week why Chief Averett was not part of the panel. And uh, I've seen Chief now two days in a row. Um, I know she's out in the community all the time. We had just had Chief here um, uh, for a full session on, uh, you know, welcoming, welcoming her to Los Altos. And it was not meant as a slight or anything else. Um, I think we could have a three hour conversation on ALPRs if we uh, if we wanted to. But um, anyway, I just wanted to address that because it, it came up uh, earlier this week. And uh, and, you know, I, I think it's great. Thank you so much for joining us today, Chief. Um, so uh, I can tell by the the comments in the chat that we ha will have lots of questions here. Um, uh, please uh, ask, uh, raise your virtual hand and we'll get to the questions. I checked with Renee and Hector in advance, and they can go a little bit over until around 940. So, um, uh, you know, if you could, uh, no speeches, please. I, I think a lot of people want to share a lot of data about various things. But if you have a question for the uh, panel, please raise your hand. And, um, you know, I really appreciate the the dialogue back and forth. Um, so thank you, Renee and Hector, for, uh, for that. Um, let me switch over to gallery view for us here. And I see, um, first question I see is from Jim Fenton. Go ahead, Jim. Hi, thank you. This, this is actually maybe more of a question for Chief Haverett than for the panel, but I'll, I'll just throw it out here. Uh, Los Altos has had uh, automated license plate readers for several years, uh, I believe vehicle mounted. And, um, but I thought I had heard recently that, that we were no longer using them. I was wondering if uh, someone could uh, share information about what our experience has been with them, and if we're not using them, why we aren't. Chief, I don't, I don't know if you want to chime in. Um, I, I, I don't see you on my screen right now, but I think you're here. I'm still here. Can you hear me? Yes, please, please do if you'd like to. Um, go ahead. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'll try to keep my comments brief. Um, so about. Uh, nine years ago, uh, we did install um, a license plate reader camera on a vehicle. That technology is very old now. Um, the information was being uh, provided to us by um, um, a local or Bay Area intelligence agency. Um, they stopped sharing data. So effectively, our mobile ALPR camera is ineffective. We don't have any information, so we're not using it. So let me just throw that out there. Um, and if I could just address one or two things really, really quickly. Um, a comment was made earlier um, about, you know, just hiring a detective. Well, I could hire a million detectives, but if they don't have the tools that they need to do their jobs, they're not going to be effective. So we have incredible brain power here in the PD, but we are, have our limits. We need technology to help bring us to the finish line to help solve um, cases. And as far as the error rates are concerned, um, there are currently error rates without ALPR technology. Um, the stolen vehicle system is not fail proof. Sometimes people recover their own stolen vehicles and don't follow up with the police. And, and yes, if the vehicle is still showing stolen in the system, they will be pulled out at gunpoint. That is, that is a fact, but that has nothing to do with AOPRs. That's, um, you know, human error in, in that um, respect. And then lastly, there are no additional staff costs uh, for AOPR cameras. Um, what it does is it effectively helps us to manage our resources and gives us um, uh, a better way to be more effective in how we operate in our day-to-day -day, um, uh, crime-solving uh, abilities. Thank, thank you so much, Chief. Really appreciate that perspective. Um, let's go to uh, Rajiv. Uh, do you have a question? Yeah, thanks. Um, my question is for... Uh, um, Hector uh, from Flock. Uh, when we installed ALPR cameras in Los Altos Hills, we saw a significant decline in burglary rates for about two months. After that, as you know, our burglary rates have skyrocketed. They're now four times what they were two years ago. Um, and the reason is that the burglars have figured out that if they come into town with no license plate, no action is taken because your system doesn't notify uh, law enforcement 
that there's a vehicle, you know, promptly, because you don't treat it the same way as a hot list. The second thing is uh, they now go and get a freshly stolen plate, which is not yet in the hot list system, and come into town. So effectively rendering ALPRs useless in those two situations. Um, is Flock going to do something about that? Because currently the 40, 40 plus cameras we have in town are practically worthless given those two problems. Hey, we're doing, uh, sorry, I'm here getting a little feedback. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so a couple of things there, I think what we mentioned in our discussion is there are very specifics to the types of crimes that, that folks are or different communities are experiencing, right? And so I think I saw in the chat kind of uh, a little bit of information on kind of what that specific crime is. Um, and so so it is very specific to, to that area. But in addition to that, I think you made a really good point, which is how do you, how is there a way to alert for vehicles without um, license plates? We do provide a vehicle alert based on a description. Um, however, there is no statewide list ahead of time that we can pull into, right? And so as we've had discussions with Lair and other folks in this specific community, uh, you know, it's objective information that we want, we need to provide to police, right? This is a vehicle that's been identified as stolen um, because there's a stop that's going to be associated with that. If yeah. the police currently, um, if if they have a, suspe a, a suspicion or have been, you know, there's somebody that's reported something and say, this is the vehicle, they can put a specific alert on that vehicle type, but there has to be an investigation that commences because there's nothing at, uh, there's no statewide list or way. There actually is, sorry. Uh, if you go to winfreecheck.com, uh, it'll tell you for a given license plate what the make and model of, uh, and year of the vehicle is. You guys are not using that currently to report mismatched license plates. And that's why freshly stolen license plates work for burglars. Yeah. And so, again, a, a really important to focus on the fact that the state DOJ list, you know, this is something that's objective information, that these are related to felonies, not misdemeanors, right? And so, it is important, as we've talked about in this discussion, there is a balancing act of ensuring that we're protecting people's liberty, civil liberties as well as privacy. And so that's the balance that we have to strike. That doesn't mean that that's not a tool that can be developed or that there's ways around that, right? So that doesn't mean that that's not the, the case, but you know, judging by the discussion here and just with other communities, it seems like, or not, it seems like there is a desire to make sure that this is objective information provided, you know, that is vetted through the, the state DOJ. Yeah. And, well, I'm and just saying that right now we can't deter burglaries with the systems because of these two holes. So just want to put that out there. Thank, thank you, Rajiv. Appreciate the perspective. And, and Rajiv um, was very helpful to me in um, getting more background on the Los Altos Hills deployment. And I, I thank you for spending the time with me to, uh, as I prepped for this session today. Um, before we go to Marie, um, I know some of you will have to leave right at 930. We'll keep going till 940. But um, just two uh, quick announcements. Um, our next meeting is going to be Friday, April 21st from 830 to 930. Um, please join us for a fireside chat with California State Senator Josh Becker. Should be a great discussion. Um, if you'd like to be added to our mailing list, um, please email info at losaltoscommunitycoalition.org. And uh, Kim will uh, has already posted that in the chat. And um, as always, a big thank you to the Los Altos Mountain View Community Foundation for providing LACC with financial and in-kind support. We really appreciate it. Um, uh, and Curtis uh, said he's in a noisy environment. He's going to text me a message here shortly. But let's go to Marie for her question. And if anybody else has a question, please raise your hand. Oh, thank I'm, you. I'm sorry, uh, Marie. Renee had her had her hand up. Did you want to add something? I was wondering if I could respond to a, a few of those questions as well. Oh, sure. Please, please do. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, yeah. So I think, um, so Chief Averett's comment that we're taking away a tool that um, she could use uh, in her arsenal. Um, well, this tool hasn't been shown to be effective. So if you were a gardener and we were taking away your spade, to dig, um, I could understand that frustration, but I think I this is more like taking away your toothbrush that you're using to dig. 
Um, so I don't think it's been an effective tool to do the things we want it to do. And if it was, we would have seen results in our neighbors that were kind of spectacular. Um, and also, yes, errors in the hot list have been there, but when you are getting like 100 hits a day, those errors are compounded, right? You're scanning hundreds of thousands of plates, um, getting hundreds of hits a day. Those those errors are going to get worse. Um, yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Sorry, I didn't see you waving your hand there. Renee. No, no there's, worries. There's 30 people on my screen. Um, Marie, we'll go to you, then Curtis, and then I see Janine, and uh, and we'll we'll get to those questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, Hector, in your opening remarks, you mentioned that the cameras need cellular slash internet capability um, in order to function properly. Do, do In Los Altos, there's been a lot of concern about the adequacy of our um, infrastructure in that regard. What do you know about, I mean, do we have the adequate infrastructure to make the to allow the cameras to work effectively. Yeah, so the way that uh, we uh, create our deployments is that we have um, a deployment specialist to actually check uh, what the cellular connectivity is. We work um, with Verizon, T-Mobile, AT and T, so all of the uh, service providers and FirstNet, which uh, which is specifically for law enforcement. Um, and so we'll, depending on the where the location of the camera is, we'll use the best um, cellular network available there, and and to make sure that that there's full connectivity. So that would not be Verizon, in my experience. So uh, glad, glad so to we'll hear that. find we'll 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 see that. I'll let I'll give folks a note if if we start that then. All right. Yeah, I mean, I think it varies from place to place in town too. So, you know, some places do, really have nothing. I, like I can't use my cell phone in this house. Yes, it's not, it's not, we'll do as verified. The data would be coming to me, but you know, still that that's an illustration of the point I'm trying to make. Yep. Yeah, and they'll verify that. And sometimes a couple feet or you know, a couple tens of feet will make a difference in those. So they'll check for which one's best. All right, and Curtis, um, it, it says he's in a noisy background, so he didn't want to um, ask the question. His question is, quote, are ALPR concerns a technology problem or a police trust issue? Imagine if, comma, practically, and, and the cost aside, comma, a city hired officers to stand on 25 street intersections, looking at every car, writing down license plates, and comparing them against a hot list, wouldn't bias and error be greater with those humans or would that be an acceptable and preferred solution? I'm not sure who this question is to, but Renee and Hector, would either of you like to uh, respond? Yeah, I can take that. Um, I think, so there are errors in the plate reading technology, 7%, um, I believe, Hector, you have 93% accuracy, so 7% read errors. Um, but the bigger concern are the errors in the hot list themselves. So even if you put those 10 police officers on those street corners writing down those plates, the database that you're comparing it against has those errors, right? And um, so there is still that concern. And with the 10 officers, you're gonna get maybe 10 plates read per hour. Here you're reading hundreds, you're reading like hundreds of thousands of plate with automated technology. And so our point is those errors get compounded. Um, and because of the high volume, there's a lot of mistakes that can happen. And what, what I would just like to add to that is, you know, what is great about these systems that it does provide that objectivity versus having a police officer, right? So um, versus having someone scan specific plates that they may think it are suspicious, this is using the best resource that's available, which are the state level hot list, and then still requiring that they check, uh, verify on that, right? So taking out that potential bias. Um, and then also, you know, everything else being really, if it's not used in investigation, set aside and um, hard deleted. So it is about providing the right information at the right time, because the information that is on that on those lists, it, these are felony vehicles, um, you know, these are objectively, that's something that is, you know, a crime. And so it's important for police to follow up and investigate on those. And so that's how we do see success um, nationwide in solving pretty heinous crimes. And then just as we mentioned, obviously, it's a no brainer with stolen vehicles, but every single day we help solve 
burglaries, um, kidnappings, um, you know, as I mentioned in San Marino, they have seen a, a significant reduction in, in specifically their burglaries. So um, important to, to to weigh all those things because the other side is it it isn't feasible for any city to have a police officer. And I don't think we would want to have police officers at every corner um, from a civil liberties perspective either. And I think I would contest that we have seen those significant reductions due to the ALPRs. So that's where that, that difference is. All right, um, Janine. Janine, are you, oh, there you go. Hi. Sorry, my system is a little slow. Can you hear me? Am I coming through clearly? Yes, it's a little garbled, but go ahead. Okay, I'll I will speak slowly. If you turn um, off video, it'll help the throughput. We'll do that here. Go ahead. My question is to Hector. Um, thanks for being here, Hector. We've spoken before. Um, my question is this. Uh, specifically, uh, will you please just, you know, specifically describe uh, the metadata to which you refer? I think you've used the word thumbprint when you originally spoke with us but uh, we'll call it metadata, to which you refer about what is collected about the individual cars. Um, it's my understanding per your description and our research that substantially more than just the make, model, color, and license plate are collected. Um, please you know, be comprehensive um, because significant concerns exist that as the AI learns to correlate a reading with a reaction, i.e. a hit, that more subjective criteria can be applied to triggering a PD response. Thanks. Thank you, thank you. That's a really important question. So the vehicle fingerprint um, is what we call it at Flock. Um, helps the machine learning put that metadata, you know, as, uh, or associate it with the with an image. And so some of the filters are going to include roof rack, uh, bike rack, the color, as we mentioned, the make, the mod model, um, you know, a specific type of rims basically any information that a witness may be able to provide to police so that they can hone in because sometimes you know they may just they may have a couple of things they might have said hey it has i just saw that it had a, a roof rack that's all i saw right and so um, providing them as many filters as possible is important um to the the point you made about um information that's that may be eventually not as objective and um, really the the machine learning is only focusing in on vehicle identifiers, nothing that is, you know, uh, hey, what does that bumper sticker say, right? Nothing that can be used in a different way that's that's objective. Um, more just like it had a bumper sticker, it um, has a roof rack um, and, 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 and things of the sort. I hope that answers your question. Janine, good? Um, well, uh, all I'm saying is the concern is that it, it can become subjective very quickly because it, there is a an officer or an Allen list that is interpreting that data, and then that can be deployed disproportionately or inequitably. That is the concern that currently exists in, in several lawsuits as well as just general activist organizations. But I, I hear what you said. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it would only be, used, be able to use this as part of a case. Again, everything is tracked, all of their searches. Um, and so, and there's audits, et cetera. But again, importantly, you know, they have to go down through the investigation and see if, hey, does that match what we're looking for? So, um, but but definitely hear you as well. Well, with that, um, I, I just wanted to call out one response from Chief in the, um, in the chat uh, about the Los Altos response time um, being under 10 minutes uh, from the time of call of an officer on scene. And for priority calls, um, it, it averages under seven minutes. Um, Chief, I'm, I'm not sure what a priority call is. Is that like a active burglary or you know someone's uh, being attacked or something like that? Yeah, those are um, in progress crimes, um, collisions, um, anything involving injury. Um, that's what that uh, is about. Yes. That, thank you so much, and th and thank you again for uh, for being here today. So. Um, uh, I think we went through the announcements, and as I promised these guys, I'm going to get them out of here by 940 so they can get on to their next meetings. I just want to say thank you so much to Renee and to Hector for a civil uh, conversation and also to the rest of the audience, and um, uh, really well done. You guys both advocated 
for your respective, uh, you know, uh, positions really well. And we just want to thank you so much for taking the time and joining us this morning. Um, and hopefully we'll see uh, everybody else in a couple of weeks for Senator Josh Becker. Thank you so much. Have a Thanks. great day, everybody. Thanks so much to the Community you. Coalition for having us. My pleasure. All, our pleasure, I should say. Likewise, and thank you to all of the residents. You guys are great. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.